My name is Cody Merrick, and I made a documentary about scary stories to tell in the dark. This new web series aims to delve more into the stories, the films, the meanings behind the scary stories we tell ourselves. I spent five years researching. These are the stories I found. They get right inside your body, you can't stop them. Oh my God. Oh my God. The red Spiders are a natural entry point for horror, like snakes and other creepy crawlies. One way to make them a potent force is to make them giant, which has film origins easily going back to monster movies of the 1950s and before, but it's certainly present in today's B-horror. Two recent and memorable examples that go beyond the typical monster flick are Coraline, and of course It, both the TV series and of course the major film release, which no doubt includes a direct homage to 1982's The Thing. You gotta be fucking, fucking kidding. kidding. <laughs> but one spidery image that seems to occur again and again has a long history in urban legend, and that is the image of spiders pouring from a person's skin. <laughs> it existed as an urban legend for years. A woman finds a pimple, a blemish. It's an image that immediately conjures a compelling theme, which is adolescence and the changes a body goes through. Then in 1991, it was included in the third issue of Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which helped catapult it into one of the most popular and horrifying urban legends of modern times. Here it is being depicted in Urban Legends 3, Bloody Mary. Get ready for it. Oh. Nice. It's one series that always made sure to include such gruesome teenage myths. And in typical fashion for such teen flicks, the nuance and the undertones aren't particularly important. It's fun, sure, but it doesn't rely much on the spiders themselves. It relies on less clothing on our female teen and quickly turns to gorier effects to create a scare. And now we come to the 2019 adaptation of Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark which more fully relies on the implicit horror of the urban legend in the book. The Red Spot is a story about a young girl named Ruth who discovers a, what she thinks is a pimple on her face. Notice the choice to have the victim be preparing for a school play. What teenager doesn't dread being in front of their peers? Bright lights pointed towards them, brandishing a horrible, disgusting zit. A lot of that story has to do with the fact that we're often afraid of what our body is doing, the changes our body is undergoing. When you're in elementary school and middle school and high school, your body is constantly changing and evolving. And a lot of times that can be scary. It's something that you can't control. You have no control over it. I mean, the body is just a very weird place. <laughs> and they have a lot of work to make it make sense and make it to signify it into something that they have at least some modicum of control over. That story really taps into this idea that we really oftentimes don't have control over what our bodies do. Interestingly, the undercurrent is not only the fear of bad skin. What is another thing that girls are afraid might happen when they are in high school? What do teenagers fear might also begin to grow in their bodies? Yes, the red spot most definitely alludes to a fear of teen pregnancy. <laughs> Breaching the integrity of your own skin and then having babies come out of it. I think these kind of urban legends are made more interesting and more impactful when they have real world fears. Let's just say breaking out from underneath the surface. And now we turn to a film you may not have caught in its first run. 
1987's The Believers has a rather gruesome example of the spider bite urban legend, perhaps the most gruesome we've ever seen. Wait, before we see that horror, and yes, it is something all right, let's rewind. Brought to us by John Schlesinger and starring Martin Sheen, The Believers clearly is setting itself among a long line of religious-based horror films. Unlike the other films, The Believers doesn't shy away from cultural and racial undertones of the subject, which admittedly is problematic. To look the film up, its legacy is one of dated cult black magic tropes that aren't exactly looked upon in a positive light in this day and age. As Roger Ebert put in his review of this movie about a Caribbean voodoo cult, I'm getting tired of the dingy tenements in Spanish Harlem with the blood-soaked chicken feathers and the scenes where the shrink realizes he needs a witch doctor to save his child. For me, there are some interesting ideas here, but it is hard to see past the muddying of ideas it is aspiring towards. A lot of them are into it up there. They got up chickens, magic, shit like that. My God, do you really think we're savages? What are you people so afraid of? Of your ignorance of your prejudice. The Believers is engrossed in the juxtaposition of Roman Catholicism and its more accepted religious traditions and rituals mixed with quote-unquote dark religions and their practices. Movies about cults can be great for horror flicks, it can be rich with questions about different cultures and their rituals. It's pretty debatable whether this film successfully tackles the subject. At the very least, it is an interesting juxtaposition with some more modern horror films. A scene from The Believers and one from Get Out. I want you to join us. How do you feel now? and another scene next to Hereditary. Now we get to the topic at hand, spiders. First we have Jimmy Smith's and his snake problems. Then we turn to this poor lady, played by Helen Shaver. What I find interesting is that these creatures crawling underneath the skin become a metaphor for what the film is interested in, religion. Underneath what society finds appropriate religious rituals or what others could consider barbaric, cult-like, evil. The spiders living in our skin become a powerful metaphor, in this case, a religious one. I'm not saying it entirely works in this film, but it at least results in a fresh examination of this particular use of the spider urban legend. Okay, now here we go. The Believers is obviously interested in a religious analogy when it comes to spiders under our skin but you'll notice that it is still a woman being invaded. Going back to the red spot, there are definitely implications involving womanhood and women's bodies that is hard to ignore. That is a horror. That's a place of horror when a body morphs all the way up through alien. <laughs> If you're saying to yourself, wait, there aren't spiders in the Alien movies. I say the xenomorphs are absolutely spider-like, and the defining characteristic of them from the beginning is their ability to lay eggs in people's bodies and burst forth. Symbolically, they are exactly the same as the fear in the spider by urban legend. In fact, original creator Dan O'Bannon is quoted as saying that the inspiration is from spider wasps laying their eggs in the abdomen of spiders. If you thought the spider urban legend had insinuations of pregnancy, it has nothing on the Alien franchise. I would go so far as to say that if you don't think the Alien franchise is entirely about birth, 
rape, and abortions, then you're completely out of your mind. It's one gigantic rape metaphor over and over and over and over. From the first moments, let's look at the beginning of Alien and Aliens. The first film, it's a slow, almost angelic look at the crew, as if they are babies slowly waking up in an incubator. In Aliens, a robotic scan enters this ship akin to an ultrasound, looking for life and eventually finding it in Ripley. And then there is all the stuff we know. The guy plays with an egg and, and big surprise, is impregnated. Yes, raped. What the hell is that? And like the spider babies, the xenomorph baby is birthed from the guy. And of course, he is still inside the ship, mother. Mother! Yes, the M-U-T-H-U-R 6000, known simply as mother to the crew members of the Nostromo, is the 2.1 terabyte AI mainframe that served as the computer mainframe for the Nostromo. Morning, mother. When the alien invades the bodies of the crew of the Nostromo, it also was breaching their ship, the Mother. It was impregnating them, so to speak. Nice, right? It doesn't just have acid for blood. Sure, that's great, but when threatened, it also impregnates its adversary. It's got a wonderful defense mechanism. Same as spiders invading your face, it's difficult to get rid of something that's inside your body. Who wants to claw their own face apart, right? Finally, in the end, Ripley does abort the xenomorph though it briefly hangs on by an umbilical cord. Fast forward to the sequel. In many ways, Aliens is the reverse of Alien. Rather than the alien impregnating the body of the ship, in Aliens, the military crew are the ones infiltrating the home of the aliens. Yes, the goal is to survive, but is also to make themselves out with Newt, the little girl they find. What really drives this home are details in the director's cut of Aliens, which both Cameron and Sigourney Weaver prefer. In that cut, Ripley has lost a child. Her daughter, we didn't know she had, had grown old and died as she floated out in space for decades. She most definitely is grieving for her baby she lost. Then when she is trying to convince others that there is an alien, a baby, Ripley isn't believed by others. He saw thousands of eggs there. Thousands. Thank you, that will be all. God damn it, that's not all. With her being advised to seek psychiatric help. Similar to a woman seeing a blemish and being told it is merely a pimple. Or similar to a woman who lost her child but can't easily get over it. I think personally for you it would be the best thing in the world to get out there and face this thing. Get back on the horse. Spare me, Burke. I've had my psych evaluation this month. There isn't anything growing inside. There is nothing to worry about. You're just mad. You're just a crazy maternal woman. So then we get the testosterone-filled military crew. Nothing maternal here. They are the embodiment of paternal instincts, filled with guns, ammunition, and a cocky attitude. If there is a baby that needs to be killed, xenomorphs, or a baby that needs to be removed, newt, they are going to do it in a manly way. Check it out. <laughs> hey, Ripley, don't worry. Me and my squad of ultimate badasses will protect you. <laughs> Finally, in the end, Ripley suits up in the famous exoskeleton. So rather than Ripley getting a bigger, manlier gun to blow up the queen, you could say she becomes the ultimate mother, the ultimate maternal machine that must take on the alien mother. Get away from her, you bitch! And of course, she aborts that alien. <laughs> Abortion appears again and again in the franchise. Alien 3, she aborts herself with the baby. Alien Resurrection starts off with what you could consider a normal abortion that leads to crazy freak abortions. And finally, Prometheus returns to what could be considered the most obvious allusion to pregnancy and abortion. <laughs> Spiders and the imagery that has resulted in their use is obviously deep-seated and wrapped up with important themes that get at the heart of the human condition. They are used for fun, 
but they are also used as an important tool in the sandbox of horror. Spiders, what a fascinating topic. If you haven't already, please check out Scary Stories, now available on streaming and DVD. Thanks for listening to this episode of Scary Studies, the series that examines the stories, movies, and myths of what we find scary. All done with the ultimate message. Horror is fascinating.